Thank you all for coming. Um, it's, uh, I'm really happy to introduce um, Emmerich and Denny, um, who have been here the last three months. It's been great fun working with them this summer and um, on many different things. Um, what they're going to tell you about today is a new um, set of libraries and a, and a domain-specific language in FSTAR called Steel that um, we hope to use to uh, scale up reasoning about state in FSTAR. Thanks, Nick, for the introduction. It's our pleasure to be here today and present to you the results of our internship. Many critical systems nowadays still are implemented in low-level languages such as C. Think, for instance, of operating systems or of the HTTPS stack. Such systems are really the cornerstone of modern cybersecurity, and because of that, the cost of failure is really high. So they are systems that are a very good target for formal verification. Unfortunately, verified low-level programming is still very hard, and one of the biggest issues comes when we start reasoning about memory, and because especially of aliasing. So in low-level languages, you can have pointers pointing to kind of arbitrary regions of memory, and you have no guarantees that if you have two different variables, they might not alias. So that means that once you start performing updates to some variables, you have to reason about, is this other variable, this other value in my context, actually updated as well or not? And that means that proving that some invariance on, let's say, states or complex memory objects is becoming much harder to prove as well. And all of that is just assuming we are verifying sequential programs. Once we start thinking about concurrent programs, it becomes even harder because suddenly you have several agents that are sharing some memory, performing updates and memory accesses on the same memory, and so you have a lot of interference going on. So over the past few years, Several uh, projects have been successful in verifying low-level programs, and I only want to mention a few today that were developed as part of Project Everest. The first one is Evercrypt, which is a verified industrial-grade cryptographic provider implemented in FSTAR, and which extracts to a mix of C and assembly code for maximum performance. And one of the many really impressive things about Evercrypt is that its performance beats state-of-the-art unverified implementation in many cases. The other project I want to mention is Everparse, which, as the name suggests, provides verified parsers and serializers. And there is ongoing work to actually integrate the verified uh, Everparse library into Microsoft's Hyper-V. So such projects showed that verified low-level programming was not viable. Like, they total about 100,000 lines of code. They are pretty massive projects. But it still requires a lot of effort. It requires a lot of human interaction, human annotation, and it sometimes feels like climbing a mountain. So why is that the problem? So FSTAR is an SMT-based tool for verification. And as many other SMT-based tools, it reasons in memory using classical whole logic and select update reasoning. And it has many advantages. First of all, it's fairly general. It's fairly simple. It's nice first-order logic. So it's very nice to encode into SMT logic. But it's also known to have issues scaling up. So what are the other possibilities? Over the past 20 years, there has been a lot of research into types-based aliasing control systems in the PL community. And it's languages such as Cyclone or Vault that have been developed over the past 20 years. And these ideas finally made their way into mainstream languages, such as the Rust language. So Rust is a language that provides you with many fascinating guarantees, such as memory safety and data rest freedom, and all of that by virtue of typing. So what this means is that if you have a Rust program that type checks and compiles, you are guaranteed to have memory safety and data rest freedom. And so that's great, because for many people, you get all those properties, that's all they need. But unfortunately, it's not yet good enough for critical systems. First of all, Rust programs are not verified. They are not proven correct. So you have safety, but you don't have formal uh, functional correctness, for instance. And second, Rust has this system called unsafe blocks that allows you to temporarily escape Rust's type system. And it has its uses, it has its reasons, but that also kind of defeats the purpose of having all of these nice safety guarantees in Rust as soon as you go into the unsafe world. So today, we are presenting Steel, which aims at providing ownership and verification via resource typing. So Steel is a domain-specific language which is solidly embedded into a type theory-based proof assistance, namely FSTAR. And our target with Steel is really general-purpose concurrent systems programming. So, Steel programs are unsure to be always safe. And on top of that, 
a user can decide how much he or she wants to verify about the programs. It can range from nothing at all, we just want memory safety, we're fine with that, to full-fledged uh, complex security and functional properties. And as it is generally embedded into F-star, we can also prove that its core theory is sound within F-star logic. And in addition, still is very extensible with new constructs. As it's implemented in F-star, we can just prove, uh, implement and prove some new libraries and then package them to give them to the user as part of a Steel framework. So here are the main ideas and concepts inside of Steel. Steel is designed as a separation logic abstraction on top of the F-star memory model. So we are seeing uh, heap predicates as resources, and we provide separation and framing for them in order to do inference control. We also allow to reason about permissions on such resources. That is, we can either have an exclusive mutable or a shared immutable or read-only access to resources. And finally, we are aiming at concurrency, and so we want to be able to prove and to implement and verify uh, concurrent programs in a simple fork join concurrency model with flux. So over this internship, we laid the foundations for this steel framework. And that means we implemented and proved the core memory model correct. We implemented a system for resources with separation, permissions, framing. And we provided operators to start to implement and verify concurrent programs. Building upon that, we uh, started implementing several verified libraries instead of steals for both singly and doubly linked lists. But as a disclaimer, we don't believe that this framework is mature yet. There still are many quirks, many things we want to solve. Like for instance, it still requires more annotations than we would like. It still needs to be, uh, specifications still needs to be formulated in a specific way for things to work smoothly. So it still requires a lot of user knowledge. So in a sense, this summer was about still episode one. And we are hoping that after a few more months of work, we can get it all nice and shiny to give it the bright future it really deserves. So now that we know why we're doing this steel framework, we're going to dive into the, the main ideas of the framework. And as you'll be able to see, they kind of build on each other. So uh, first, we have to start with the idea of resource. So before in low star, in the F star that we had before, uh, we used to see each function as taking a whole heap and then transforming into another heap. But actually, these functions, they operate in a very small portion of the heap. So we wanted to restrict actually what uh, each individual function could say about the heap. In order to do that, we first have the concept of footprint. A resource, which is what the functions are going to talk about, have a, has a footprint, which is a, a heap fragment and not the whole heap. And then on this footprint, we're going to attach an invariant, which is going to be um, a consistent assertion that's going to be valid across all the heaps. OK, so given those two simple ideas, we can define some uh, examples of resources. First, you have the empty resource. The footprint is just the non-location. There's no location, uh, no footprint associated to it. And the invariant is always true. But then we have more uh, interesting resources. We have the pointer resource, the array resource. They each point to a single um, cell in our memory model. And the invariant is that they're live. They should be live uh, across all heaps when we want to talk about them. Live meaning that they're not dereferenced. They've been allocated and not dereferenced. OK, so now we have like the basic blocks of our resource uh, building. But we can actually say more uh, rich things about resources. For instance, we can talk about their contents. This resource says that pointer p points to value v. The array b points to an array of size 2. Which, whose first, com whose first cell is, contains a value which is greater than zero. And you can see you can use this resource uh, language to actually specify what's happening inside a particular heap. So we attach the third component to our resources, which, are, which is the view. And the view is quite, kind of uh, not as important as the last two, uh, but it's kind of high, high level um, description of what the contents of the heap are associated to this resource. So now that we have our resources, we can separate them. Because in separation logic, the, um, we have this very uh, pervasive operator, which is a star operator, and that lets us define the heap as a collection of things that are disjoint to each other. And this is the, the basic block we're going to use to build our steel framework. For instance, 
In separation logic, you would write a heap containing two pointers pointing to two different values, and you can see those pointers are not aliased because, there is, because of the star operator. And we can say that in our steel framework using our resource language, when we define the star as like uh, the footprints are disjoint. Okay, so then we can actually have some separation logic inside F star with this resource language. Let's define a list. So here is the single link list X that corresponds to a, a list L. What resources is that? If L is empty, then the resource is just the empty resource. And if L is a, the head of the list and then the tail, then the resource is just the pointer X should point to the head, starred, meaning not LAS with the rest of the list. So that's nice. We now have a way to specify fragments of the heap in a fairly uh, logical and uh, it's what you're used to if you use separation logic. Now we have to enforce that the heap is actually corresponds to this description of the heap. And we do that uh, with resource typing. We actually leverage F star's effect system and define a new computation type, which is called RST. So for a computation of type alpha, we can say that the computation expects a heap satisfying all the things described in resource and provides, after the computation, a new resource, which is going to describe the heap fragments after the computation. And you can see here there's a function. It's because the final resource can depend on the value returned by the computation. So this is very theoretical. Let's give some examples right now. What happens when we want to allocate a pointer? So this is the alloc, alloc function. It takes a value and returns a pointer pointing to, the, to the, this value of this type. So what, how to specify that using resources? Well, at the beginning, you just expect nothing. The allocation function should work anywhere. So you expect empty resource. And then you're going to provide the resource, which is going to be pointer pointing towards your value. And you can see here, we take advantage of the, the function mechanism. You can talk in your final resource about the value that's been returned by your function. Let's do another example. Let's say you want to update the value inside the pointer. So this is the classical function, take a pointer, the new value you want to be the pointer to uh, point to. It's a stateful function returning a unit. It expects the pointer p, we don't care what's the value inside the pointer. But then, in the end, we're going to have a pointer that points to v. And here we don't use the unit uh, thing that's returned by the function. OK. So now we have a way to specify. Some questions about mutation. Oh, yeah. This one. <laughs> Feel free to ask, uh, ask me something if you hear something you don't understand. But this is. Okay, I'll ask a question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. is, is pointer p both a resource and the left hand side of this um, pointer p? <laughs> Is that the same, that's the same expression pointer P that's been used in? So actually here you can see there's a difference and it's... It's good. like PTRP. Yeah, so there's, and it, there's a, it's a difference for a reason because as you can see here, pointer alpha is the type of like the actual value of the pointer no, P. I mean the last two lines, expects PTRP and provides PTRP arrow V. Mm -hmm. that, so, so you put a, re, so PTRP is a resource and you put it on the left side of a the little arrow, is that right? So, okay, so I, I think there are two arrows. Sorry for the confusion. This is like the classical the arrow function. So, so that's PTRP, and PTRP matched to V is a resource refinement. A refinement, okay. So, it's a ref so PTRP is just saying, you have a pointer, it's live, I don't know what it points to. Uh -huh. PTRP matched to V, is a, it's live, and it actually points to V. So if we come back here, we can have the standard pointer resource. And then we can refine this resource saying that the pointer actually points to me. Okay, and I can put any resource on the left hand side of the map yep. arrow? Okay. Yeah. And there's an interpretation for any kind of resource that makes sense? Or is it depend on the type of the resource? You have you have to define this refinement for I mean, there is a way to inside the framework to actually let you define that, but uh, it's it's called ref, resource refinement, but uh, maybe we're gonna get a little and, bit and every resource has a view. Okay. That's a, the value that's in the, in the resource. Oh, that's okay. 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 
So for these two functions, so a walk yep. and the, uh, I guess, pointer assignment. Yep. Um, do these, so, so, so there's the effect there. Yeah. Um, but do these functions have an implementation? Yes, they have. Uh, okay. This is just the specification, this is right. the develop. Okay. Uh, okay. The implementation I'm going to talk to about okay. later. Uh, so now we can actually specify uh, what our functions sh should do in terms of our new uh, nice separation logic d description. Actually, staying on that specification, uh, if you want to specify things using a full separation logic style, then if you want to specify the increment function for a pointer, let's say you have a pointer to an int and yet you want to add one to the value, then if you want to specify it using this separation logic, you actually have to say, okay, there's a ghost value, which is like the value contained inside the pointer. And then you have to say, okay, the, the value after is v plus one. But this is not the style in which we're used to specify functions in F star uh, historically, uh, because we don't want to carry these ghost arguments around because we're actually extracting to see, so we have make, to make sure they erase, et cetera, et cetera. So we actually provide a, a hatch to actually use the old style of specification in conjunction with the separation logic. So let's say you're defining your increment function again, you're specifying your increment function again, but then you're adopting a less precise description of, of the, um, the resource. Because here you're only talking about the shape of the heap, you're not talking about the contents. And to talk about the contents, you can add another clause in your specification, which is going to be a traditional ensures clause. And ensures clause is going to provide you with old and new, which, with which you can access the view of your resources before and after the computation. So then you can say, okay, so the new view of PTRV, which is like the value inside the pointer, is equal to the old view of PTRP plus one. And that allows you to have a more stateful specification style if you don't want to carry this ghost value around. Okay, that was a side note. Now let's move on to the implementation of these functions. No, they're not keywords. They're uh, in the implementation. They're just functions. They're functions that that take a resource which you have in context and return the view to you. And they're not accessible from provides. Is that you you have you have a a requires clause that's uh, symmetrical to ensures. You have like expects provides and then require in its ensures. So if ensures is the same as provides, and then you have a requires clause that's the same as. Expect. If I wanted to just say provides and then have a view there, pointer p points to the old pointer p plus one. I can't say that. No, no you can't say that. Okay. You can't say that, and that's one of the pitfalls of uh, separation logic specification. You have to actually carry all the values in your program in the specification. Okay. But we support both styles. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's up to you both. to decide which uh, you prefer. Okay. It's, it's either like the left or the right. There's no in between. That's right. Okay. Uh, uh, there's, uh, I mean, you could have said, uh, you could have bound a ghost value for some of your pointers, but not for other, other pointers. Yeah. So there could be a middle ground. And you could bind the ghost value once, say, additionally, well, it happens to be greater than, let's say, zero or something. And it requires close or just close. So, yeah. You could talk about something that doesn't exist anymore and new. Well, so actually, this is like going to a fairly technical point, but uh, I can provide you the answer. These old and new functions, they're actually functions that have a restricted domain and you can only apply them to stuff that is inside your resource context. So if you, if for a deallocation function, the provides would be the, the empty heap. And so you can apply new to only things that are contained inside the empty resource, which is nothing. So we guarantee that you can't talk about things that don't exist. Okay, thanks. But th this might be a little technical, so let let's move on with the... I, I just to add one more thing, just to emphasize, old and new are certainly not the whole heap. Yeah. We, we, we will never let you speak about the contents of the entire heap. All your specifications are small footprint. Yeah. If you leave out provides, is the assumption that the resource doesn't change, or that it, or the resource goes away? 
So for now, you always have to include expects and provide clauses. So you have to describe, and uh, in your provide clause, if if the resource isn't there, it goes away. So like, it provides EMP as the as the default. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Let's move on to implementing these functions with we We're in the process of specifying. So the way you implement and prove memory safety about your functions in separation logic is that you use the frame rule. The frame rule says that if you have a function from Q to R, Q to R, then you can apply it to some P star Q and it's going to give you a P star R. P is going to be untouched by the function. The neat thing is that we can actually express that rule as a steel function, a special function that's going to take the initial and final resource context the function, Q and R, and it's just going to return your computation with the right uh, resource context. So with that function, and actually this is like the workhorse of steel because all of your function calls, they should be encapsulated inside the frame rule. So that for each stateful operation on the heap, you know precisely which part is modified and which part is untouched. And that's, that, that's what allows us to have modularity when reasoning about the heap. But the frame rule uh, and encoding all of that inside F star and reaching a level of automation and uh, usability for the user, it has been challenging. For instance, let's say you have some P star Q star R in the context and that you have a function which just works on Q in, returns the Q prime. Then what you want is you want to actually select the Q inside and then perform your computation, then recompose the things together. But actually, you have to prove all these steps. So first, you have like to rewrite this term using uh, associativity and commutativity, isolate the queue, apply the frame rule, apply f, then recompose via all the still the frame rule your queue prime, and then actually rewrite the term again in order to have your queue prime here. And all of these steps have to be proven. And the way to do that with an SMT is that you take this term and you like ex explode the context with all of the possible rewritings of that in hope that if you further, in order to apply that, you select the correct one. This is not very efficient. The second problem is that uh, we're going higher order with these combinators because before with the update uh, uh, select um, heap model, we just had higher uh, the first order ter um, terms we, which we could feed to the SMT. But then, since our resource are heap predicates, the star, which is like takes two resources and return a resource, is actually higher order because these types they hide some uh, some functions inside them. So these specifications and these verification conditions that are stemming from the specification using separation logic are not going to compose well of the SMT. So. The classic way to solve verification conditions, not manually for a star, just to feed them with SMT. But since 2017, we have tactics and we have in something called meta F star. So what we're actually going to do is that we're, we will be crafting tactics to solve all of the verification conditions tied to our separation logic specification framework and the rest we're going to feed to SMT as before. And it's using that mix of tactic and SMT that we can reach uh, a level of usability and uh, niceness for the user in the framework. So this is the first concept of uh, steel and we have something that lets you specify function using separation logic and prove that they respect that specification using the framework. But now, as Emric mentioned, we want to be able to talk about ownership and what if you want to share data across different actors or something. Right now, with the stuff that was already presented, all the functions, re they require exclusive ownership. If you remember the update pointer which I've shown you earlier, here having the pointer P resource in the context when you call it means that you have exclusive ownership over that pointer. And it is the case because you can't duplicate uh, resources in your context because the context is a list of disjoint resources. So if you have two pointers aliasing to the same thing, they can't be disjoint from each other. But what if we want to? What if we only wanted to read p? Then we have like a read-only p in our context, and then the type checker should like disallow these kind of updates mechanisms. Well, 
we can actually do that. It's a classic extension to separation logic. We can define read-only resources, read-only R, and read-write R, read-write resources. Then, for instance, our pointer dereference specification, which is like takes the pointer and returns the value inside it, just expects the read-only resource and provides the read-only resource pointing to V. And here we know that because they're read-only, the contents haven't been modified. Okay, so how do we produce these read-only resources? We have a rule for that, the share rule, which takes a pointer and we will return another pointer. So it expects the first pointer to be read-write and then it's going to return another pointer, which is going to be the immutable copy of the first pointer. And you can see that in the final heap, the two pointers are disjoint using our separation logic framework, although they're aliased. So in that way, we can control precisely where, what's the aliasing that can be done. The, so this a classical extension to separation logic usually comes with a way, okay, so we have like multiple read-only copies of the resource, but then we want to gather them back and recover full permission at some point. And usually the separation logics include some scoped allocation, the allocation mechanism for like uh, having some read-only and then gathering them back at the end. But we said, okay, we have SMT, so why not go like more general than that? So we actually implemented fractional permissions. We just said, okay, so you have a resource in the heap, it says a permission like a fraction between zero and one. One meaning that you have full permission. So then the gather rule is that, okay, you just have two pointers. They're disjoint but have permission F. Then when you gather them back, you just have a single pointer with the sum of the permissions of both. And the, the other pointer is not in the context, meaning that you can't talk about it anymore, it's not live anymore, you can't access this, it's gone. Of course, you can't do, you can't do that with like every pointer, you have, there have to be LS to the same thing for you to, to be able to do that. So the nice thing about this extension is that it stays within the trusted computing base and the memory model, because we actually implement those permissions as a ghost value is stored somewhere inside the heap. And all the permissions, when you manipulate permissions inside the steel framework, everything is static, it's statically checked, and you have to account for all the permission things. But we can do that because we have SMT that's going to ease us with this task. And actually, if you don't want to use fractional permission because it's too complicated, and if your needs are something much simpler, like scoped allocation of uh, read only resource, then you can define it as a verified library on top of the existing framework. And that allows us to define more uh, restricted patterns of uh, permission usage while staying in the sound, sound world. And now for the next main idea, I'm going to hand over. Another question about the fractional permission. Yeah. Just say PTRP. Uh, does that have like a default permission on it? PTRP, if you want to say anything, it has permission one. You have full access. Yeah, you have full access. The last main concept of Steel is how do we handle concurrency? How do we implement and verify concurrent programs? So our target here is we want to prove that our programs are data race free, and we are going to assume that we are in a sequentially consistent model. And we are focusing especially on simple concurrency model, which is a simple scoped fork join model with a power combinator and we're gonna be sharing mutable memory using locks. So how does this work? Steel is very heavily inspired uh, from separation logic and separation logic has a standard extension called concurrent separation logic to handle concurrency. The idea being, if you have two functions, f and g, that work on different heap fragments, you can just execute them in parallel assuming the different heap fragments are actually separated. So in other words, what this means is if you have two functions that operate on disjoint separated regions of memory, it is safe to fork, execute them in parallel, wait until they terminate, and then join again to resume the execution of the main program. And so that's something that is very is easily expressible in Steel. We can just define this power combinator that takes exactly these two functions, and assuming they actually operate on separated uh, resources, we can execute them in parallel safely. And that's a model that is already fairly expressive. For instance, if you think about a merge sort on list, the way merge sort works is you split the list somewhere, 
you take two sublists, you sort them recursively, and then you merge again at the end. So that's something that is very parallelizable because you can just sort your two sublists uh, in parallel. And that's something that can be captured by power because these two sublists are actually disjoint. Similarly, in our context, when we have different, uh, pointers to immutable, different immutable pointers to resources, we are considering that they are separated as well. So you, using this power combinator, we can also uh, share immutable resources across agents. But what happens if we actually want to share mutable memory? One of the classic examples is this uh, consumer-producer model, where basically you have two agents that are sharing one data structure, usually a queue, and one of the agents is filling the queue, the other one is emptying the queue, and basically they are both performing updates and reads on the same data structure in parallel. So how does this work? Luckily for us, concurrent separation logic also has a solution, which is based on locks. So the idea is, if we have a heap predicate P, initially in our context, we can take a lock that is associated to this specific heap predicate. And once this heap region is locked, after creating the lock, it's not available anymore because we cannot access it without actually acquiring the lock. And so because of that, we have this acquire and release functions that take a specific lock and say, well, if I acquire the lock, I now have this resource in my context, meaning I can operate on it, I can access it, I can update it. And conversely, release will say, we are not releasing the lock, we don't have access personally to this resource anymore, but other people will be allowed to access the lock. And one of the many very interesting things here is this resource is not just a memory object. It also comes with a heap predicate, with an invariant. And this invariant will be unshared by the locks. So the idea is, whenever we acquire a lock, we also acquire the heap invariant that is associated to the lock. And then that means we can do whatever we want with the resource, and then when we release it, we will need again to prove that this invariant is satisfied. And that is safe because whenever we have a lock, nobody else, no other agent can actually access the resource, not even read from the resource. So in a sense, we don't need to preserve the invariant between the acquisition and the release. We only need to prove that it's preserved again when we release the log and allow other agents to access the log. So again, in still, this is fairly straightforward to specify. We can just, for instance, have this acquire function that takes a log on a resource, doesn't need anything at the beginning, and gives you the resource back. And that's something, so all of these invariants, they are checked statically again using SMT solving since we are doing verification. But the av availability of locks is checked at runtime. We have blocking semantics, meaning if you try to acquire a lock and the lock is already owned by somebody else, you are just going to wait until this lock becomes available. So that also means that at the moment, at least, we are not trying to prevent deadlocks. It might be the case that you are waiting for a lock that will never be released. And so your program will block. So P is a predicate. Um, it can so also be a predicate. P here on the left is a predicate in separation logic, and it's equivalent to this R, which is a resource in our framework. So, so let's say I acquire a lock yes. as a predicate, and I execute a function that allocates new cells that happen to satisfy the predicate. Do those new cells also become part of that wide resource? No, because uh, these new cells will have will be about a different heap fragment. So in a sense, it's not just a predicate; it's a heap fragment with a predicate on this specific heap fragment. So if you just allocate new cell, you will be in a different heap fragment, and hence you will have a different resource. Then how do we handle cases where you acquire a link, a lock that protects a link list, and allocate two elements to the link list that should be protected by the same? Yeah. yeah you, uh, can, you can do that. So, this, so you can have a resource for a link list that says, this, this captures a uh, abstract location in memory that is uh, potentially unbounded. Uh, and uh, but it's reachable from, say, the head of the list. And you can allocate and, uh, the, the, and yeah, say, cons on the, add to the tail of the list, let's say, um, and then package it back into the same, uh, as, as the same resources before. Uh, yep. Yeah. So for concurrency, all of the operators we have currently don't have an implementation. And because of that, to ensure that we still have all of the safety properties for our steel programs, we need to provide a proof of soundness of our concurrency model. And that's something that we are still working on, that is still a work in progress. But so basically, I just want to give a general idea of this proof. So we are working in a sequential model, which means that we are going to cons consider that functions are a list of atomic instructions, being either operations on lock, acquire or release, or 
updates or reads from memory. So we have two functions here, f and g, that have a list of atomic operations. And they operate on separated resources. And they are sharing perhaps some log memory. So basically, what we want to prove is that for any possible interleaving of these atomic operations, that is non-blocking, then we still have this specification that is admissible. That is, assuming we have these initial start resources, in the end, we indeed get these start resources. And that's something that we are actually formalizing and proving in F star. This is not a proof on paper, but that is still a work in progress. So building upon this, um, I want to spend a bit of time just presenting what we can actually do with this steel framework. And one of the best examples of that is how do you implement linked lists? So linked lists have, are a fairly dynamic structure with a lot of aliasing. And because of that, that's a nice uh, example to showcase what our framework can do. So as we presented previously, it's really straightforward and easy to define what a list resource is. It's just you have a pointer. And if a pointer points to an empty list, you actually don't have anything. You have the empty heap. If it does not, if it points to a non-empty list, you have the head pointer that points to the head of a list. And then recursively, you have the next pointer that points to the rest of the list. And so this is a nice, clean, concise specification for lines to encapsulate all of the invariants about your list. Using that, you can define, uh, you can rather give signatures for the usual operations on lists. For instance, appending an element at the beginning of a list. So here, what we are saying is, if we have a pointer to a cell that is separated from a pointer to a list, we can just append this element at the head of a list. And what we get in the end is a pointer to the whole list where the element was appended. And similarly, we can define a map operation, where we are saying, again, we have a pointer to a list initially. We have a function that will operate on the cells of these lists. And in the end, what we get is the same list where the f function was applied to all of the cells of the list. And so in comparison, this is what it looks like in low star, which is the current DSL for doing low level verification in f star. Just this specification of what is a valid list takes about 20 lines in f star. And I omitted this for brevity, but basically it's saying we have this invariant, and then we have to define exactly what the heap fragment is. It's much more complex to define. And then, for instance, defining the same function, append, uh, or rather cons, takes a lot more work because we have to specify carefully all of the invariants. We have to specify exactly what is modified. I don't want to go too much into detail, but it's just if you look on the left, it looks much cleaner and nicer than what is on the right. And so because of that, in the current uh, stages of steel, we are providing uh, cons, heap, tail, and map uh, primitives for lists. And their specification takes about 30 lines of code in steel, where it takes about 100 lines in low star. And that's just our specification. Once you start looking at the implementation, it becomes much, much worse. Because implementation in steel is going to be very straightforward, as I'll show in a minute. While implementation in Lowstar will involve a lot of lemmas to reason, again, about aliasing and things like that. So what does this implementation actually look like in steel? I just want to show a very small excerpt of uh, how the map function actually works. And this is the recursive case of a map function, where you are first applying the function to the head of a list and then recursively applying map to the tail of the list. So here, what we are seeing is that we need to apply this frame rule of separation logic to do that. Because when we are first updating the head of a list, the rest of the list should remain untouched. And similarly, when we are updating the tail of a list, the head of a list should remain untouched. And that's still a limitation of our framework, which is we have to apply this frame rule uh, explicitly. We have to give exactly what is in the context initially and at the end of the execution of each function. We would much rather have something simple like that, which is, well, I want to apply a function. I'm applying a function. That's all I need to know. The framework should take care of all of that for us. That's a fairly tricky problem. It requires a lot of engineering and language design. And we are working on having a better frame inference and perhaps some syntax that would uh, do that automatically for the user. So the last example I want to quickly mention is doubly linked lists. Over the last few, day, over the last few days, uh, Nick implemented doubly linked lists in Steel. And he implemented a few of the like, common primitives, such as allocating a list, concatenating two doubling lists, appending an element at the beginning or at the tail. And doing that for the whole specification, implementation, and proof took about 400 lines of code. And it took Nick a few hours of work to do that. In comparison, there is a doubly linked list in Lostar, which is slightly more complex. But this library, to specify all of the invariant, and especially to prove all of the implementations correct with respect to aliasing, takes thousands of lines of code. So it seems to suggest that Steel is much more uh, adapted to this kind of complex aliasing problems. 
And it also seems to be making for proofs that are both faster and more robust than the existing Go Star framework. So in comparison, this, yes? How many of those 400 lines are for this framing? Uh, Quite a few. So <laughs> it will be even nicer once the framework is mature. But yeah. Okay. yeah. <coughs> so that's kind of like the current status, and it hopefully should be even better once we are uh, actually like in a few more months. So yeah. I, mean, I should say one thing. I had to write that we were writing these the applications the frame by hand, but the tactics are solving. That are still doing all the AC rewriting. So I just have to assert what I, what resource I have right now, and what resource I expect to get afterwards, and the, the tactic does the rest. So it's not. Um, it's, yeah. it's still sort of manageable. So you need you yeah. need this manual annotations, but in a sense, I don't think you needed any external lemmas to prove anything. Yeah. Uh, while you know the doubly linked list library that currently exists in Lostar is full of such, such lemmas to reason about aliasing and what's modified and whatnot. And yeah, one of the interesting parts is this doubly linked list structure. That's actually something that is not expressible in safe Rust. And the reason for that is that Rust's safe type system has some restriction on aliasing. And especially, it is restricted to unaliased tree shaped data structure. So, doubly linked lists aliasing is too complex for the current Rust. You need to implement it in the unsafe world if you want to do it in Rust. So, you, so your answer to dealing with unsafe blocks is to not have any, is to prevent, is to not need them, not to be able to deal with them. At the moment, we think we don't need them. And I'll just talk in a minute about what could possibly be a way to dealing with unsafe blocks. Uh, yeah. So after this internship, what do we have left to do? Um, we still think that for this framework to be mature, we need a few more months of work in order to be uh, comfortable with unleashing users. And the biggest item is we want to make this framework more usable. I hinted at some things, for instance, this frame rule that we have to apply explicitly. We have some ideas, perhaps doing a front-end syntax to hide some of the gory details make it easier for the user to use the framework. And that's really a lot of language design work to do that. Um, we also want to make sure that we are fine tuning as much as we can the queries that are passed to SMT solvers so that we have some nice abstractions, but we don't want to leak accidentally some things that are not needed by the SMT solver and might just confuse it. And if we want to have a comprehensive framework that allows you to do verified low-level programming, we also probably need more basic libraries. Like we currently have a fairly comprehensive library for both pointer and arrays, and basic ones for lists and doubly linked lists. We probably need some more like base data structures and so on. And additionally, one other thing we really want to do is have a nice and complete operation with the existing Lostar, which is again this framework to do uh, low-level programming in FSTAR at the moment. And the reason for that is that First of all, we have many fascinating projects such as Evercrypt or Everparse that are currently implemented in Nostar. And we would really like to build upon them, not just throw them away because we are changing the framework. So we need a way to be able to build upon them, to preserve all of the guarantees, and to have all of these that implement operate smoothly. And the second reason is that possibly you could almost see unsafe logs as a form of C, and Nostar can be pretty adapted to some forms of C. So it would perhaps be possible if you really want to break all of the guarantees to verify the equivalent of very unsafe blocks into low star and it operates. So that's also something we are thinking about. We are not sure exactly what the need would be. So that's our future. And the last item we have left is also to actually wrap up this uh, concurrency model. So first of all, there exists technique to statically prevent deadlocks. Uh, we want to see if we could apply them to our framework and also see uh, if the framework still remains efficient and scalable this way. And we also need to, well, complete our proof of soundness to ensure that everything remains safe and nice. So to conclude, over the summer, we finally gave F-Star its long-awaited star, which is great. What took so long? Well, separation logic, if you just have SMT solving, it's, it's not working. It's not scalable. It's too hard to specify. It has higher order logic. It just doesn't work. So first of all, we had to wait for F-Star to have this tactics framework that allows you to reason about these kind of things. But there have also been previous attempts at doing separation logic with tactics. And if you just use pure tactics, it becomes tedious. For instance, there was a previous implementation with tactics of appending two linked lists. And it took about 100 lines of manually applying tactics. It was very tedious. It was just not so nice to program with. So what really worked with us with Summer was the nice combination, the great combination of tactics and SMT solving. 
with the right abstractions, including resource typing, to make it work and to make it scale. And building upon that, we have many fascinating applications that could be uh, targeted. And we can finally go beyond crypto verification. So a first one is, if we can verify concurrent programs, we might be able to verify concurrent uh, network protocols, such as Quick. And the other one is, if we can actually scale up to bigger systems, we might just be able to verify critical system components in, let's say, Azure. So there is some work with the Hyper-V people. We might be able to verify some parts of Hyper-V or some parts of Azure CCF. And we might also have many uh, possible synergies with other projects. In Morally, we are fairly close to what Rust is doing. So maybe we could be able to verify Rust programs inside of Steel. And we actually want to see if we can design a front-end language to verify Rust programs directly inside Steel. And there is also this Verona language that is developed currently at Microsoft Research Cambridge, uh, which basically does ownership-based systems programming. And it would be interesting to see if we can perhaps verify some of its components inside of Steel and have a nice collaboration with uh, these people so that we can have a more comprehensive tool in a sense. So, yeah, we would like to take some time to give our citizens th sincere thanks to both Nick and Jonathan, our advisor over the summer, for all of the help and advice they provided. Uh, we'd like to thank also Takina and Danel for the help they provided with both the FSTAR memory model and the meta -FSTAR framework. And also more generally to all of Project Everest members and the MSR community for many fun and interesting discussions throughout the summer. Thank you. So, um, Josh Burdine told me that he has a uh, specialized solver for separation logic based on rewriting things into model forms. That something that would fit with your tactic? So, so what does the solver do exactly? Just so, so, so his, his claim is that as you do the symbolic execution with this uh, separation logic, um, it's an advantage to know what is e necessarily equal you can simplify uh, terms uh, drastic like front end. The default SMT solver uh, interface doesn't really give you that mm -hmm. information. So I guess it might be somewhat similar to what we are doing, but one of the nice parts about this specific framework, at least to apply it to F-star, is we don't need to extend it with any additional solver. In a sense, we are purely using what currently exists. We have a tactics framework in F-star that already exists and that we already trust. And we already have an encoding of F-star verification conditions into Z3. So, but they are inefficient, right? So, so the, if you were only using the encoding into SMT, yep. it would be really inefficient because of this equivalence of star. That's correct. Sensitivity, commutativity. That's correct. So the idea is really discharge this hard verification conditions for Z3 inside of the tactics. So doing all of this associative and community writing with tactics by manipulating the so, terms. So, so what happens under the hood is that you have this uh, associativity and commutative uh, operator, which is star. Mm. What we do is we normalize both terms of the both sides of the equal. Inside, the, we have a tactic to normalize to the normal. terms, yeah. and then we compare the normalized form. That's how we manage to do as, it. As a fast filter. Yeah. Yes. So, so I think he takes it one step further. And, and Okay. So do the semantic conversation. That's fine. Maybe you can do that with the tactics as well. Okay, we'll look into that then. Other questions? So what's a code generation story from a string to Executing. Code generation story. Mm -hmm. So the plan is still to reuse the existing pipeline. Uh, so there is currently a compiler from Lostar, the existing DSL, to C. And so the idea is we are defining Steel as an abstraction of the existing Lostar. So since it's just an abstraction, once we try to extract, we want to just reuse the existing code. And there might be some like, minor changes to do, but that's the general idea. Yeah, it, it actually extracts pretty well with like existing Kremlin. The, the only downside is that for permissions, let's say you want to share data, what, the way we prove that inside of the memory, memory model is that we have to look in the heap to see what are the permissions and update them. So it's going to extract to like a read and update, but you don't think you don't do anything with the value you've updated so it, because it's ghost. So we, we, would, we would need to like uh, remove that because it's unnecessary uh, and performant. 
But yes, it's extractor C, no runtime. The model of locks you have, can you store them in the heap? Sorry, can you what? Can you store your lock pointers in the heap? Um, <laughs> so that's something that we didn't completely sort out yet. Uh, the whole concurrency model is still a work in progress. But I think that's what we are aiming for, right? Yeah, locks are just values. So you can store them in the heap, but you can't, uh, but locks do not have lifetime of their own. You can't reclaim a lock. Right, but will you not run into like step indexing hell with your semantics if you go down this route, if you're not careful? Maybe. We, we're, uh, <laughs> uh, we should talk more. Uh... Yeah, happy to set up a call if you want. Okay. But to, to implement a lock, don't you need to keep allocate something, some sort of shared state? If, I mean, you can't just pass it around. You can't just pass copies of the lock around as a value. No, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a ref, it's okay. morally a ref. Okay. I have a question about your frame rule. Somehow syntactically, you were using a p star q as a variable. Yeah. What, was that cheating or we have that syntax? So it, it was a presentation cheating. Uh, a, a lot of the work that still remains to be done with the framework is actually making sure that you can use the frame rule with that uh, syntactic cheating. Because basically, uh, I'm going to show back the, the rule back again. Yeah. I mean, it, it binds P and Q separately, not binding P yeah. star Q. Yeah. No, so the, the, the thing is that when you use it currently, you actually feed it P star Q. And then it, it resolves P because it looks at, because it knows Q and R from the function. It knows P star Q and Q star, P star R. So the remaining thing is that you have to. So it's. Okay. Let me, let me, okay. So you know. Q and R from the function, you know P star Q and P star R, so what you don't know is P. And the actual, there's a tactic that will like find P from P star Q and P star R because you know Q and R. So that's that's the cheating, but it it's solved by a tactic actually. So to answer your question, no, we don't actually write P star Q, we write like author zero and author one, and then inferring the actual P is done uh, automatically pro tactic. Cool. And uh, we we'd be happy to like send you some code pointers if you want to look more in detail to that. A couple of minutes for more questions, if any. So follow. So does that mean you have to have precision on your formula here in separation logic, or what? What about disjunction? I guess is the question. We don't have disjunction. Okay. Is star the only operator for, for, yes, for combining resources? resources. Yes. All right. Um, let's thank uh, American Dinner.